Thanks for joining us today. Pastor is continuing his series, Life Hacks. But before that, let's get ready to worship. I believe that you came out this morning to worship him. And if you're able to, stand to your feet. And let's just begin this worship right now. Amen. Let's give him one more hand clap of praise.
chains And so you came to be my rescue To part the waters in my way Jesus, you are my deliverance From death to life From dark to light Jesus, you show me what freedom is And you call my name You broke my shame You are my deliverance
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. So powerful. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. Sing it. I speak Jesus. We declare. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, and burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety. To every hole held captive by. I speak Jesus Cause your name Your name is power Your name is healing Your name Break every stronghold Break every stronghold Shine through in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in Darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. 
Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus oh. yes. just a moment in your presence God
breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set. A film projector is a storyteller. It does this by taking a film reel that consists of thousands of images. Light is then passed through each frame, projecting an image onto a canvas. These images in sequence can tell us a powerful story of happiness, sadness, or even humor. Our lives in many ways are like a film projector. Every action we take and word we speak builds the narrative 
of a story God is wanting to tell through us. Even though we all have different backgrounds, we have a choice of what we will project when the light of God shines through us. So what would someone see if they watched the movie of your life? Would they see light or darkness? Would they see life or death? Would they see love? Would they see grace? Would they see faith? Would they see Jesus? When I was 19 years old in college, I went to the uh, Oklahoma State Fair Arena and watched the, the Guess Who in concert. And Burton Cummings was the lead singer and the keyboard player for the Guess Who, and they were very popular in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, so when Burton Cummings began to sing that song, the girls swooned in the State Fair Arena. But uh, the, the whole idea this morning is whose eyes are you seeing your life through? Are you seeing it through your eyes, somebody else's eyes, or are you seeing it through God's eyes? How many of you know there's a difference in all three of those? And we have to be very careful that we don't get it off kilter. Stand with me this morning. So good to see you. We're glad that you are here. And if you do have something on the Barbie this morning, as uh, Tanner said, just invite all of us to come over to your house after the service. Uh, we would, you know, just get a thousand plates and we'll be ready. Uh, people always have eyes to see us a certain way. And if you don't watch it, you will begin to see as they see you. And that's not always healthy. And so we have to be careful we don't get into that, that mode. L -l Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your many blessings. We're so glad to be here in your presence, Lord, in this sanctuary together. And Lord, speak to our hearts through your word. In Jesus' holy name, and everybody said amen. Turn to your neighbors. I'm glad you're here today. We've been in a series called Life Hacks. How can we help somebody else or how can something help us live life a little bit easier? So there was an Italian family who immigrated to the United States and the family got into a little bit of trouble, kind of a mob type family in some organized crime. And so one of the sons, Vinny, went to prison. And so Papa went to see his son Vinny in prison, and they talked through the glass, you know, the, the phones, one on each side. And so he said, Vinny, how you doing? And he said, well, Papa, I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, prison life's not always that great. And he said, Papa, how you doing? He said, well, Vinny, I'm doing okay. I'm up in years, and, you know, it's time to plant the garden, and uh, I'd like to plant my tomatoes, but I went out there the other day. The ground was so hard I couldn't hardly dig it up. And uh, I'll try it later. And so Vinny said, Papa, he said, don't dig up the garden. That's where I buried all the bodies. <laughs> so the next morning at 7 o'clock, the FBI, the local law enforcement uh, uh, you know, officers are there, and they're digging up the garden, looking for the bodies, didn't find any. And then Vin, Vinny kind of got hold of his dad. He said, Dad, go ahead and plant your tomatoes. I did all I could do for you from where I'm at. Kind of a life hack, want to make dad's, you know, life a little easier. So I think the way that we get life a little easier is we, uh, we hear the word of God. And we apply it to our life. It's not just something we read and we think we go through the motions, but we have to say and see what God does in our lives. So the life hack wisdom today is your identity is not always found in what other people see in us, in you, or about us. Uh, question. Did Jesus go through the thing, same things that we go through? And the answer is what? Yes. Did people see Jesus as something he was not? And the answer is yes. Could many people see him as illegitimate? And the answer is yes. Because that birth with Mary before Mary and Joseph came together, there could have been some talk in Nazareth. There could have been a talk in Bethlehem. Well, you do know. I mean, this was all over Facebook back in Nazareth. I mean, you do know she was pregnant before she got with Joseph. You do know that he was raised in a barn or birthed in a barn. I mean, you do know. So Jesus has gone through some of that, and some of you have gone through that. 
Uh, he was accused of being a lawbreaker, a Sabbath breaker. He was accused of being demon possessed. This is in John chapter 8, 48, 49. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And they identified him as being from nowhere, a nobody from nowhere. You are a Samaritan. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You remember that line? So here Jesus is. He is the Son of God, God in the flesh. So he's gone through what we go through. And now they are say, seeing him and saying things about him that's absolutely not true. And so now we have to be careful about our own identity and how we look through these eyes that we look through. So let me just go through several things this morning with you that I think will be advantageous. Sometimes we identify ourselves and we see ourselves through our vocation or our job. Men are really bad about that. So tell me about yourself. Well, I am a lawyer. I'm a doctor. I am a business owner. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a welder. I'm a rancher. I'm a farmer. Or, ladies, I'm a beautician. I'm a nurse. I'm a practitioner. You know, I'm a doctor. You know, we, we could go on and on. The list goes on and on. And we can identify ourselves with our vocation, with our job. And we do that. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying, you are more than just a job description. And what happens if you don't have that job anymore? Or what happens when you retire? So a lot of people, they lose a little bit of their identity when they retire or they change jobs because so often our identity is attached to the vocation or the job. And you know that's true. Nothing wrong with it, but I'm just saying don't get caught up in that because it can become our handle or our identity, and when we no longer have that, then it becomes problematic. Sometimes we attach our identity to our life traumas, and people have life traumas, and they are a victim of, and some really are a victim of. I'm a victim of abuse or a rape or I'm a, you know, a, a physical or mental abuse, an injury, a divorce, a disease. I was not nurtured by my parents. I did not have the same opportunities that they had or you had. I didn't have the education. And all those things can be true, but don't let that be your identity. I heard the other day somebody said some people need a victimectomy. I've had them aptendectomy, but some people need a vit victim, you know, just, just take that out, T take that part out, because some people identify through their victim nature, and, and they live that, and it goes over and over and over and over again. Uh, sometimes we attach identity to people's talents. That's the jock. That's the basketball player. That's the brainiac. They never ask or said that about me. Uh, that's the nerd. She's the dancer. He's the musician. Uh, she's the one who has the green thumb. How, how many of you know sometimes we identify people with their talents? But what happens is when we do that, there's much more to us than that. And at times we can get in trouble because that good quarterback, that good running back, that good defensive back that was in high school is not always going to stay in high school, right? I mean, there's going to be a point where you move on from that, and if that was your identity, you're going to have some problems with that. So you say, well, I'm going to go to play at a D1 school. Let me tell you, only 2% of all college athletes go to a D1 school. And you say, well, I'll be in that 2%. I hope you are. And then if you think you're going to go to the NFL, only 1.6% of the 2% go to the NFL or the NBA. So you don't want to get attached too much to your talent because I found out talents can come and they can go. So if you're 30 years old and you're still wearing your Letterman jacket... Or back in my day, we had a deal we called, we used to drag main. Does anybody know that term? <laughs> so dragging main was, you know, going down to the end of Main Street, making, you know, a U-turn, going back, and, you know, you dr drug main. In, in Duncan, you know, you went by the A&W root beer stand, you know, you went out on East Main, and you, you drug main. Listen, if you're 30 years old in your Letterman jacket and you're still dragging main, you may have a problem. 
So when you identify with that too much, it becomes problematic. Can I hear an amen? So some people, you know, they, they do that. Sometimes we attach identities to body uniqueness and body types. And sometimes it can be body shaming. Uh, we have terms like this, that's chubs, pooch, saddlebags, thunder thighs, fat so, melon head, shorty, skinny. Um, you've never heard any of those, have you? When I was in college, we had a guy that I roomed with for a while, and we all lived in a townhouse together. He was like 6'4", and weighed 130 pounds. We called him Stick Man. Now, I didn't give him the name. They put that moniker on him back in high school, so when he got in college, he was still carrying that. And we didn't mean anything bad by it, but some, you know, are not really bad nicknames. But how many of you know some are really horrible nicknames? And so when they get attached to you, sometimes you think, well, that's my identity, and people can talk about your body type, you know, whether it's skinny or big or tall or short. I was talking this morning in the early service about a player that I, I like to talk about. His name was Spud Webb. Many of you don't know who that is. Spud Webb was a great NBA uh, basketball player. He was five foot six and weighed 130 pounds in the NBA. Now, here's something very uh, unique about him. He won the NBA dunk contest at five foot six, 130 pounds. So I thought, you know, let me just read a little bit more about him. So he went to North Carolina to play basketball, which is a huge, huge basketball college. And Jim Valvano, who has passed on, he was the coach there at North Carolina. So one of the other uh, assistant coaches saw Spud Webb play, and he was going to recruit him for North Carolina. So he had him fly him in to Chapel Hill, and so Valvano, the head coach of North Carolina, and the assistant coach is waiting for Spud at the airport. And they're coming in from the plane, and they're coming into the terminal, and Valvano says, I don't see him. I don't see him. Valvano's looking for a very tall, black basketball player. Spud Webb is 5'6". And the coach is saying to the head coach, there he is. And Valvano, Valvano says, I don't see him. And finally, when he shows up, he turns to the other coach and he says, I think you might have made a big mistake. So I wonder, how did he get his name? His actual name is Jerome. But all of his life, he's been called Spud Webb. So when he was born, his grandmother looked at him and while he was growing up, said that his head was misshapen. And his head looked like the Sputnik satellite that the Russians launched in the 50s. So all of his life, he was called Spud Webb. And I guess he liked it. But let me tell you, some people don't like what we attach them to, and it becomes a very bad identity. Sometimes we attach identities to negative criticisms. And some of you have gone through that. Somebody called you something, said something negative about you, and it stayed with you and with you, and with you. And even to this day, you probably can recall some things that was said very negative, some critical things about you that you still remember to this day. Is that true with anybody? I I'm going to say it's true for everybody. And what we know is these critical things can attach themselves to us because people see things that really aren't true. Uh, a few years ago, it was after Easter here at Ray of Hope, you know how that goes, Easter, nerd, everybody comes to church. And uh, so we, we had our multiple services on Easter, and that last service we had, you know, the, the sanctuary is full, uh, there, there's people everywhere. And someone took a picture, and they posted on social media about this is the Easter service. So someone got on social media, and they said, this is what I see. What I see is a bunch of self-righteous people dressed up on Sunday, and this is the only time they came to church. Well, they posted that on our social media page. And so, someone came to my office and said, Pastor, I want you to see what somebody said about, you know, the, the picture that was on our social media. Now, I hardly ever, ever reply to anything negative. And I said, let me reply to that. It just got in my crawl. Does anything ever get in your crawl? Y'all are so holy. 
So it just really got to me. So I responded to that post, and I said, but let me tell you what I see. I see a group of people who've drilled water wells in Africa, who've gone on mission trips, who's given tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars to people in third world countries, that's built homes in Mexico and held vacation Bible school and showed the Jesus video project, who feeds the football team, who helps kids that don't have enough school supplies to go to school, that has a food bank that feeds the people who are hungry. That's what I see. So sometimes people see the wrong thing. So what we have to do is we have to be careful because what you see may not be reality. And especially in the culture we live today, you have to be careful what you see and how you process it because when you get that negativity and you get that criticism, this is what we know. I mean, this is not something I'm saying. Studies show that destructive criticism causes most people greater anger, conflict, tension, and causes them to set lower goals in their life instead of higher goals. Now, criticism can be good if it's constructive, but if it's negative, you're actually doing the wrong thing and getting the wrong results. So we have to be careful that we don't identify to those negative criticisms. So question, how are you living your life? What, what are you seeing through your eyes? Because this is what I know, the Lord has eyes. The Lord has eyes. And all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter six, verse eight, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Say that with me, the eyes of the Lord. First, uh, mentioned there in Genesis, but this goes on, 2 Kings chapter 13, 1 and 2, in the 23rd year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, became the king of Israel in Samaria. He reigned 17 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, 2 Kings 14, in the second year of Jehoahash, the son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, began to reign. He was there, 25, he was 25 five years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In the 15th year, verse 23 of uh, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria. He reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Chapter 15, in the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. You ought to just applaud me. I got the names read. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just telling you what is common in all those verses. The eyes of the Lord. The Lord is watching what we do, he's watching who we are, he's watching what we say, the eyes of the Lord are real. And here, verse after verse after verse, he sees who we are, he sees what we do, and he has a plan. Do you realize God has a plan for your life and my life? This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. He says, Jeremiah, before you were ever born, I had a plan for you. Do you know God has a plan for everybody here? Now, you may not be a prophet to the nations. You may be a prophet to your next door neighbor. You may be a witness to your family. You may be the prophet in your office, in your business, in your practice. God has called you for specific reasons. Now, not everybody does the same thing, but I'm going to tell you the call of God is on all of God's people. And you have a plan, and God sees you in a certain way. So question, how does God see you? Number one, God sees you as valuable. God sees you as valuable. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is speaking. Verse 28, and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and 
Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore you are of more value than many sparrows. God knows you in detail. God knows you intimately. He said the hairs on your head are numbered. Not you have the certain number, but every hair is numbered. So this morning, God had to say, okay, number 1,005 fell off in the shower that Mike was taking, and number 500 was gone. And, you know, for some of us, it doesn't take very long for him to count the hairs on our head. But I'm just saying that's how intimate God knows you. He is a detailed God that sees you very valuable, 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies or the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In that same chapter, he says, your lively stones, a holy priesthood, a spiritual house, the people of God, in the same book, he says, you're the elect of God, so you're valuable, you're special to God. That's how God sees us. Do you know one soul is worth more than the whole world? According to the Bible, Zechariah 2.8, thus saith the Lord of hosts, whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. You're the apple of God's eye because God sees you as valuable. Number two, God sees us as children. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he will give the right to become the children of God. If you believe in him, you are a child of God. Not because I said that, not because I positioned you there. I'm telling you, you're a child of God if you believe in God and Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? And let me tell you, we value our children. If you are any one type of a, of a mother or father that have any brain cells that are connecting, you love your kids. This morning I prayed for my kids. I prayed for my grandkids this morning. We love them. We want to know about them. We want to know all the details. What did you do? Where did you go? How's things going? Is anybody else like that here? This last week, our little... Uh, Four-year-old granddaughter started preschool, and we were talking. Boy, I wish I could be there. I want to see how her first day went. I want to see what she wore. And so Carrie called to know how it went, and she calls us Cece and Papa. And so Carrie said, Riley, how did your first day of school go? Did you like your teacher? And she said, as you know, Cece, I have two teachers Four years old, as you know. I have two teachers. So we, we wanted to see the picture. You know, what did she wear? What does her backpack look like? Why? Because we love them. God loves you more than you would ever, ever know. So much he gave his only begotten son that you wouldn't have to perish, right? So God loves his children. God, number three, sees us as what we can become. Remember Matthew chapter 16? Jesus asked the question to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elias. Some say that you're one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? Who are you saying I am? And then Peter, he stepped up and said, thou art the Christ, you are the son of the living God. So Jesus takes the emphasis at that moment off of him. So Peter's declaring who Jesus is. Now in turn, Jesus declares who Peter is. But this is what I want you to catch. He starts out calling him Simon Barjona, but then he says, thou art Peter. You are more than just this. You are the rock of the revelation that you're going to carry. How many of you know Peter's not the rock? Jesus is the rock. We sang about that this morning, but he's carrying the message of the foundation. He takes this rough, crude, cursing fisherman, and he says, Simon Barjona, this is who you are, but this is who you will become. Do you know he's doing that to you? He's doing that to me. Mike, this is who you are. But let me tell you, the potential I put in you, this is who you can become. 
And so he sees us as what we can become. Romans 4, 17, God calls those things that do not exist as though they did. He calls those things that are not as though they were. So, so what God does, and this is a faith thing, right? This is believing that God puts something in your life far more than what you think you have. That's how God sees you, and that's how he sees me. So we have to be careful that we don't get distracted, sometimes not thinking we can be or become or when we fail. Has anybody here ever done a belly flop for God? (laughs) Yeah, sure. I mean, I have. If you haven't done a belly flop for God, hang on. You shall flop. (laughs) So what do we do? I mean, what is... (laughs) going to happen when you feel like you're not enough, you, you can't make it, you failed, God can't use you anymore. Um, we, we have to respond right when we have a setback, and everybody's going to have a setback. So when others think that you're not enough, what do you do? I mean, when they tell you the raw, in-your-face truth, sometimes it's difficult to handle. I'm reading a book now called Winning by Tim Grover, and he shared these words about setbacks and and failures and challenges from some of the greatest names in sports, and let me just read it to you. For Michael Jordan, it was being cut from his high school basketball team. What coach in high school, in his ever-loving mind, cuts Michael Jordan from the team? But that happened. It's Tom Brady who was picked 199th in the NFL draft. Six quarterbacks were taken before Tom Brady. How many of you think there's some people who'd like to have that (laughs) do-over? Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback who has ever played in the NFL. He has a lot of rings to prove it. And so they took six other quarterbacks before him. He was 199. He has a production company. You know what the production company is called? 199. (laughs) Why did he call the production company 199? He never wanted to forget that he was passed over again and again and again and again. People don't think I'm good enough. And sometimes in your life and my life, not only do people not think we're good enough, sometimes we don't think we're good enough ourselves. So here are these amazing illustrations. Kobe Bryant had his famous air ball game as an 18-year-old rookie, 1997, in the playoffs. He shot an air ball at the end of the fourth quarter, three more in overtime. You're in the NBA, and you haven't even hit the rim yet. But Kobe Bryant turned out okay, right? Uh, Dwayne Wade received only three college scholarships, and he was... uh, declared ineligible to play his freshman year at Marquette University because he couldn't make grades. He had academic issues. Charles Barkley weighed 300 pounds as a rookie. I mean, I love listening to Charles Barkley. And when he and Shaq get together, it is hilarious. I was watching one episode as they were on the panel, and they pointed out that Charles Barkley was... uh, Uh, taking classes to learn to speak Spanish. And Shaq said, Charles, you can't even speak English, (laughs) so get that down before you speak Spanish. So Charles Barkley showed up. He's 300 pounds. He's a rookie. He asked his teammate, Moses Malone, why he wasn't getting more playing time. And this is Moses Malone's response to Barkley. You're too fat and lazy. (laughs) What do you do with that? I mean, do you get over that? Are you identify with that? So that was what he was told. Scotty Pippen began his freshman season at the University of Central Arkansas, and he began his basketball career as the team equipment manager. And every person I just read to you are in the Hall of Fame in their sports. But they had some things they had to get over and not accept people's view of who they thought they were, right? And guess what? You have to go through the same thing. And if you get knocked down, how many of you know, you got to get right back up. So here's the last one, number four. God sees you as forgiven if you will turn to him. 
God sees you as forgiven if you will turn to him. I'm going to read a verse here that many pastors would never read from their pulpit or uh, online, but let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't even know all the word of God is good. Verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. I I like that butt line there. Uh, Don't get me wrong here. But that's a big butt right here. But... You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know what he's saying? He's saying every one of us have had our issues. Some may think it's worse, some even more, some less, but let me tell you, sin is sin. And whether we want to categorize sin, that's just sin. And sometimes we don't want to hear about these things. We don't want to call things out. But let me tell you, these are not my words. These are Paul's word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so he's telling us that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Now, what do we do with that? If if God will forgive us, then how does that work? Well, number one, you've got to believe that he is God, and you have to ask him for forgiveness. Because in today's culture, people think the only thing you need to go to heaven is just die. But how many of you know, you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to come to know him and believe in him and repent of our sins because we have fallen short of the glory of God. So it's not that you are against somebody or I'm against somebody or somebody against me and somebody against you. This is thematic through all humanity God sees us as forgiven if we repent and turn to him. So people may look at you not that way or me that way, but let me tell you, God looks at you as you are forgiven if you turn to him. Can I hear an amen? Now, thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. Because without his grace and mercy, we are all in big trouble. Now, I would love to tell you that once you come to the Lord and you know him and you turn to him, you will never, ever sin again. But let me tell you, that would probably be a lie. You may have an issue afterwards. But here is the good thing here. If we live in him and we serve him and we follow him and pursue him, we are living under his grace and his mercy covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Does that mean that we don't come to a place of repentance? No. Let me tell you, I repent more than once. Does anybody here repent more than once? Sure. We all do because we are human. We're fallible. We are fallen. But yet, in this passage, when he reads about all these things, and we say, how in the world... Could people like us or people who are guilty of these sins ever, ever make it to the kingdom of God? How could they ever make it to heaven? Well, I want you to look at this marvelous verse 11. He says, okay, this is what you were, but you have been washed, you have been sanctified, and you have been justified. Say that with me. Washed, sanctified, justified. God cleaned you up, he set you apart, and made you righteous. Let's say that again. God cleaned you up, he set you apart, and he made you righteous. Not because you were righteous, but because he's righteous, and he imparted and imputed his righteousness by faith to you and to me. And how in the world can people like you and I stand before Almighty God in judgment and go to heaven? Look at your neighbor. How are they going to get there? I'll tell you how they're going to get there. They have been washed, they have been sanctified, and they have been 
justified not because they lived a perfect life, not because they're moral, not because they're rich, not because they have a great education. One reason they're going to make heaven, Jesus Christ is their Savior. That's the only reason. So how does God see us? He sees us forgiven if we turn to him. There's this marvelous thing in the Old Testament. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. We've heard it taught. I've taught it many, many times. Forty-something years I've been teaching about the Ark of the Covenant. It's this kind of oblong box, rectangular. I mean, if you don't know what it is, go watch Indiana Jones. You'll get it. (laughs) But in the Bible... This golden, overlaid, covered receptacle that has rings in the side where they can slide the poles through where the priest can carry it. The lid of that ark is called the mercy seat. On each end of that ark are fashioned angels called cherubim. The cherubim have their wings stretched out over the lid of that ark. One on one side, one on the other, their, angel, their, their angelic wings look like they're touching in the middle. And right in the middle of that, it's called the mercy seat. Inside of that ark is the manna that fell in the wilderness, Aaron's rod that budded, and the Ten Commandments that Moses had in the wilderness is laid in that ark. And God has eyes. Did we read God has eyes? And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take the blood of the sacrifice. He would walk into the Holy of Holies and he'd take the blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Why there? Why between the wings of the cherubim? Because God in his position in heaven is looking between the wings of the cherubim through the ark, through the lid, and he sees the commandments of God. But there's something he sees between the commandments In his eyes, he sees the blood of the covenant. Because if he looked down and he saw all of those things that were not, we would just always be guilty, wouldn't we? But there's this amazing thing that he has between your sin and my sin and the person next to you's sin. There is the blood he sees. He is looking through the blood. My friends, we have the blood that was shed at Calvary by our Savior, Jesus Christ, and he washed you, he sanctified you, he justified you by the blood that he shed on the cross. And now you and I, we are seen as forgiven by the eyes of God if we turn to him. But your attention, please, your neighbor may never see you that way. The person across the road may never see you that way. You will still be the old whatever you were. You're still the old you know what. But if you've come to Jesus, he doesn't see you that way anymore. He sees you as forgiven. Eyes looking through the blood. Eyes that have seen you in a different way. Listen. Don't continue in sin. Do we sin sometimes? Yes. Don't don't continue in that. Should we continue in sin that grace abounds? Paul said, God forbid that we would do that. But if you're here today and, and, and maybe you have gotten a little identification through what people called you or your body type or maybe what you did in the past or maybe you were abused or criticized, I'm hoping today, and this is a good life hat for you, don't view yourself the wrong way. Don't let other people, don't let other people establish your identity. And be careful how you even view yourself. Because God sees with different eyes. And he sees you as forgiven if you turn to him. He sees you as his child if you acknowledge him as father. And let me tell you, that's a good place to be. Washed, sanctified, 
and justified. This is what you were, Paul said, but you don't have to stay there because the Lord has the ability to wash you, sanctify you, and justify you and call you his kid for eternity in heaven with him. Would you bow your head with me this morning? Before we slip out of here and go to somebody's house for barbecue, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to know him. And if you've drifted away and you really haven't lived the life that you need to live, you need to turn to him. But today's your day. Today is the day that you can say, I've decided to follow Jesus. It's a day we can come and repent of our sins and choose him as the Lord of our life. It's just so very important, isn't it? So today, if you don't know Christ or you need to return back to walk the walk and live the life you need to live and be the person he's asking you to be, If that's you, would you just slip your hand up right now? I've got my hand up. Other people are lifting their hands. Thank you. Today's a great day to make that decision. Let me end on this. Just perk up your ears. Today you may be a believer. Today you're solid. You're going to go to heaven. You've accepted Christ as your Savior. But this is what I know. Sometimes people have said things and looked at you in a certain way that's been a problem all your life. Today, I'd like to see that lifted off of you. Please listen. Today, I would like to see that lifted off of you. How people saw you, how that maybe you wanted to abide in your victim state, but that does not define who you are. Let's see through the eyes of the Lord today. Stand up with me right now. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me. As you're standing, I want you to close your eyes. Don't look around. Stay with us. Let's not interrupt the moving of the Spirit right now. If you're a believer, you're going to go to heaven, but there's been something said, some type of look, some type of identification in your life, whether it's your profession, your mistake, something that happened to you, a tragedy, an accident, a disease, a body issue, that's really been problematic for you, would you just lift your hand up right where you are? People are lifting their hands because this is a real, real issue. This, this is not something that is a kind of a thing. It is a thing. So there's several people lifting their hands. We have several people that's going to help us pray. So I want you to come and stand right here if you're helping us pray. And they're going to face you. And right now, if you lifted your hand for any reason, nobody's going to embarrass you. You don't have to say anything to me. If you lifted your hand for any reason, I want you now to get out of your seat from the cascade section, the pews, my left, my right. I want you to just step out right now. I want you to come and just stand right here and face me. Come on. Come on. Folks, let's give these people a hand as they come right now. Come on. Several of you raised your hand. For some reason, you're not coming. That's between you and the Lord. But I believe if you come and just stand right here, God's going to begin to lift some things off of you. Let me tell you why. Because you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. So whatever that was said to you, whatever people made fun of you, whatever you you did wrong maybe, whatever hurt you had, I'm going to pray that that's going to be lifted off of you today and you're going to have your garden tilled up so you can plant your tomatoes. I need about 100 people to come and help us pray right now. Would, Would you come and help us pray? People are still coming. Come on, find somebody, stand next to them, put your hand on their shoulder. Listen, we don't have service tonight, so we can just stay here for just a minute or two to pray. So just come up, gather around somebody right now, put your hand on their shoulder, 
Stand next to them. We're going to pray that God would help them. Come on. There's people at this altar I've never seen at this altar before, so we're, we're going to pray that God would lift this up off of them. God would help them. God would strengthen them. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, help us to see through your eyes. God, not what other people saw in us, what not other people said about us, our faults, our failures, our misgivings. God, we're believing what you see in us, what you can do in us, what you can make in us, what we can become. So, Lord, as tears fall, as people cry out to you, God, as people are here in your presence, touch them, heal them, deliver them. Let that heaviness be lifted off of them today. Let them leave liberated. Let them leave uplifted. Let them leave full of the Holy Ghost today, Lord. Move, O oh God, as only you can in the Nidianda Hakashanda, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. Move, God. Touch, God. Heal, God. Deliver, God. Touch our lives in the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Lord, lift that burden, lift that weight, lift that care. God, let liberty come, let freedom come, let the guilt be lifted, let the hurt be dealt with, Lord. We cast our cares upon you today, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you're praying, just continue to pray. But the rest of you, I want you to look at me just for a moment. God sees you different than other people see you. And he sees the good in you, the potential in you, what he wants to see in you. But yet we have to cooperate with him. We have to turn to him. We have to come his way because there's no other way to come. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you hear there's a dozen ways or two ways or three ways, how many of you know that's a lie? There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. So we live in a culture today. They don't want to talk about this. They don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about perversion. Let me tell you, the only way we're going to come is God's holy way. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. God bless you. See you Wednesday. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the service. If you need any prayer, please contact us. Hope you have a great week.